All right, last time I was beginning to talk about things like motifs, profiles, etc. The whole point being that we have uh, a family of somehow related sequences or molecules. So this family is related by function or uh, ancestry or um, structure or some, some way in which this is a, a, a set of interesting molecules. But the identity, the pairwise identity between them at the sequence level is not so great that you can just uh, treat them based on sequence. You can't just, for example, take out one and then do sequence alignment of other molecules to see whether other molecules are also in this family. The sequence similarity simply is not high enough that you'll be able to identify uh, new members that way. So you need something that somehow learns from the full set. And the first thing last time is that you, I said you start with a multiple alignment. And moreover, in that multiple alignment, you uh, identify which portions of it you think are really the, uh, the more critical ones that characterize the members of this family. Now, that by itself is not such an easy matter, but let's assume we've done so. And so you, after your multiple alignment, you know, things are a little bit crooked and so on. But after the multiple alignment, you come to think that what's in this box is really this, that's the significant identifier of this family. And you can imagine that what's in this box is, a re you can characterize it by a regular expression. That's what happens in prosite. Um, but what we're talking about today is a position specific scoring matrix. So we want to come out with something that is a reflection of this multiple alignment, this portion of the multiple alignment that can be used, and this is the critical thing, it's used to identify good candidates for additional members of this family, okay? So this family, let's say, has some kind of biochemical properties, and we have many other molecules that we don't understand much about, and we would like to find others uh, that have the same biochemical properties and therefore are in this, this family. This is the kind of thing that, that um, uh, is done all the time, and in your lab this week, you're actually using, in addition to ProSite, you're using um, PFAM, which is a whole collection of protein families. That's what the P PFAM stands for. Um, protein families where they've, they have come up with a signature for each family based on something called hidden Markov models, but we'll get to those uh, next time. So right now we're just talking about the simplest and chronologically the first of these approaches, the position-specific scoring matrix. And so the example I was working on last time, we had several sequences here, which were assumed to be multiply aligned. And then we had, um, actually I guess there's six of them in this little example, one, two, three, four, five, six. And from that, in the section of interest. This, this won't necessarily be the entire length of the molecule, just as this is shown in this picture. But in the section of interest, we build a frequency table, ATCG. Mostly this technology is used for proteins, but to keep the example simple, I'm going to pretend it's DNA. And uh, in this example, we only had five positions, which is also unrealistically small. And then we just counted how many A's we saw in the first position, how many T's we saw in the first position, and so on. I'm not going to repeat that, that um, table we had that last time. And then what we did was we turned these counts into, number, into um, fractions, basically, in the following way. We had um, fraction 
of um, the fraction in position i, which is residue x, some, some residue, a, T, C, and G in a little example, divided by, in a sense, fraction expected if the sequences are random. Look at the fraction in position I. of residue x, OK? So in our little example, we were, this denominator was always going to be a fourth. We were just going to take uh, a simplistic view of DNA that every nucleotide is equally likely. Per, when you go to um, amino acids, you definitely have to uh, deviate from that. Um, and sometimes these, these numbers are taken from a collection of sequences, maybe these sequences themselves, and sometimes they're just taken from a, a full population of sequences. Um, but at any rate, this this is basically your random model. What you would expect if if you weren't looking at this particular family, if you were just uh, looking at sequences that are somehow randomly generated. Okay, and in the example uh, we were working with last time, although I think I, I made some. Arithmetic errors, this came out to be um, 2002, four thirds, uh, four thirds, four thirds, four thirds. What does every what does every column have to add up to, by the way, to at least be plausible? Anybody see? Well, the first two columns add up to four. Is that a coincidence? What's the, what's the reason that they add up to four? Hmm? Well, you're dividing by a fourth, right? Every number is being divided by a fourth. It somehow suggests that when you add those numbers together, they should add up to four, right? Anyway, seems logical. Anyway, um, ponder that one if you. Uh, and the la oh, I see we had five positions. Um, one and uh, let's see. That's I think it. Um, hmm. Who remember? Oh, you have it from last time. Yeah, tell me what the. What this should be? Two thirds. Oh, first one's two thirds. Four thirds. Okay. And two thirds. All right. And then the last one was what? Zero two zero two. Okay. All right. So if if we uh, have recorded everything correctly from last time, we have this. All right. So this by itself could be referred to as a position-specific scoring matrix. Later, we're going to take the log of each one of these terms. Okay, and that will also be a position-specific scoring matrix. But what I really want to uh, show you now is how we use these numbers to evaluate whether a new sequence is likely to be or whether we should conclude that a new sequence is plausibly or likely to be in that family and why this is a sensible way of approaching things. And if, if I explain this carefully, and if you understand what the logic is uh, in this, then you'll immediately see why we want to take the log as well. Okay. So sometimes taking the log here is a little mysterious, but um, if you understand the logic of that I'm about to explain, then 
the obvious and right thing to do is not to use these numbers, but uh, to use the uh, log of those numbers. Okay. All right. So here we have uh, some new sequence. And we want to know, is this sequence a plausible member of that family? That's, that's a family of molecules that has some interesting properties. I should have at least you know, looked up one from any, any one of these databases so I could have something that sounds like I understand some biochemistry or biology or something. I mean, if I could name some family. Can anybody propose the name of a family here? of interesting molecules that do the protein kinases or the, I don't know, what are they? The which one? The receptor tyrosine kinase. Not long enough. I want something really long and impressive. Uh, anyway, imagine I knew one of those things. And that's their family, and it has one of these motifs as a section that people think is, is significant. But it's not highly identical in that, in that region. So we can't just use sequence similarity of, let's say, a single sequence by itself to try to identify new members. But the belief is that if you look at a number of these uh, uh, tyrosine kinases, then um, you can extract out one of these patterns as, a, say, a position-specific scoring matrix that will help you identify new members. So here we have a new sequence, and we want to know, is it, uh, one of those uh, kinases. Well, this, this little window is five long, okay? So we're going to take five MERS, okay, uh, from our new sequence. And we're going to evaluate, so in each each five mer, so you take the first five and then you take the next five and so on. So each one of these is a five mer. And uh, it's going to have some sequence in there. And you want to use the position specific scoring matrix to judge how similar is this to the, the, uh, the sequences, the five mers that generated this position-specific scoring matrix, okay? And in particular, you really want to know what is the probability that this was generated by a process, by the same process that created the family members, divided by the probability that it was just generated at random, unrelated to that family, okay? So when you take, when you look at a particular fivemer, you want to use the position-specific scoring matrix to evaluate the plausibility that this sequence here, it was generated by the same process that generated those sequences over there. All right? How do we do that? Okay, so we want to use the position-specific scoring matrix to evaluate whether the new sequence is um, closely related. You know, actually, I sh I'll just say it's in the family. But it's unknown. It's not yet one that's known to be in the family, but whether it is in the family, i.e., is this K-mer, 5-mer, sufficiently similar? To the, um, the set of five MERS. If you just take a look at this five MER versus every single five MER over there, the assumption is that the sequence similarity is too, uh, is not going to be high enough. But somehow we can use this position, the PSSM, 
to answer this question. So now my question to you is how do you use the PSSM? How would you propose to do that? Any ideas? Okay, well, the way you do it is, let's see, work with this example. You take the first value, that's in, I mean, the first character, that's in position one, and you look at the value that you get in position one for that character. That's a two, all right? So two. I'm going to keep this as mysterious as possible. Uh, in the next position, that's position two. That's an A. And you get uh, here a four-thirds. Okay, so you get a four-thirds for the second character. The third one is a T in uh, third position. That's a four. Okay. The fourth one is a T, that's four thirds. And the last one is a G, that's a two. Well, I was lucky I, I missed zero. Now the question that I've left, what I've left unspecified is how do you connect these numbers? What do you do with them? You add them together, subtract them, Take the square root of each, or I mean, what? Anybody have any idea? Well, the answer is you multiply them together. Okay, so you multiply <coughs> these numbers. So to explain why you multiply, you have to go back to this definition. This is the fraction in position i, which is residue x. So if you want, that's, that's in the numerator. If you want, you can think of that fraction as a probability. Okay, Those of you who are statisticians know that's a dangerous thing. But just conceptually, imagine you knew what's the probability from that family or from the sequences that are really in the family. We, if we knew the complete uh, inventory of all the sequences that are in that family, then uh, what's the probability that in position I you have residue X? Okay. So just imagine I have now these numerators. And when I have a new sequence, AATDG, I take the probabilities that are in the numerators, and I multiply those together. What do I get when I've multiplied those numerator values together? Well, the first number I get is the probability that this character comes from that family. And the next one is the probability that this character in the second position comes from that family. And the third one is the probability that the third character comes from that family. This particular character comes from that family. So when you multiply the numerators together, then... multiplying the numerators the numerators of what of this of this thing gives the probability or you can think of it as the probability that the new 5 mer 
is generated by the same process that generated the five MERS in the family, the known five, five MERS. Okay, there's actually a hidden assumption here about this generation. So we're saying, here we have these whole set of five MERS. And they were somehow generated by some process or force of nature or something that, that created them. And there is an implicit assumption that each position in these five MERS is independent of the other positions. So at position one, there's some probability distribution for what that character is going to be. Then at position two, there's some probability distribution of what that character is going to be among the members in the family. And that these probability distributions for position one and position two are independent. Okay? And the same thing two and three and so on. So if I have this fraction in position I, which is residue X, and when I take when I look at a new sequence and I multiply together those fractions, the numerators, what I end up with is the probability that what was generated, the new sequence, was generated or could be generated by the, uh, it's probably that it was generated by the same process that generated the, uh, the known five MERS. Okay? Everybody understand that? All right, but now we're not going to multiply together just the, the numerator. We're, new, we're multiplying together the denominator as well. What does the denominator tell you when you multiply those numbers together? See, the den denominator has the fraction in position i of residue x uh, if the sequences are random or the expected fraction. So when you take a look at AT, AA, TTG, and you multiply together uh, the number for the first position, that's, we said it was a quarter. They're all going to be a quarter in this little example. So it's a quarter times a quarter times a quarter times a quarter times a quarter. That's the probability that that specific sequence, AA, TTG, was generated just randomly without any connection whatsoever to this particular family. All right. So the den denominator multiply the denominator to get the probability that the five mer is generated at random. Okay, And therefore, when you take this product, it's the product of the numerator divided by the product of the denominator. So it's the product of the numerators divided by the product of the denominators. So it's the probability that the 5 mer you're looking at was generated by the same process that generated these divided by the probability that it was generated at random. And if that ratio is very large, at some point you pick a threshold of, uh, of comfort or confidence so that when the ratio is very large, you say, well, it looks reasonable to conclude or to think that uh, this, this new uh, five mer was actually generated in the same way that the old five mers were. And if the ratio is low, then uh, you can't, uh, feel confident in that conclusion. Okay. Actually, if you if you take a more traditional statistical view, you would have the null hypothesis, which is that uh, the sequence was generated at random, and what you're interested <coughs> in is rejecting that null hypothesis if the 
if that probability here, uh, that number is big, is sufficiently large compared to this number. Okay. All right, for those of you who are geneticists or biologists of some sort, you've seen this before many, many times. It's got a different name in biology. What's it called in, in genetics? Okay. Uh, no, no takers? Well, maybe you haven't seen it quite in this way. How many people have seen a LOD score, LOD? Okay, what does it stand for? Log of odds. Okay, so let's take away the log because we have no logger we have no logarithm in here yet. The O D stands for odds. Okay? It's okay, sorry, it's usually called log odds, not a log odds score, but a log odds what? Ratio. Okay. So Log odds ratio, but there's no log here yet. So odds ratio. Well, what does this look like? It's an odds ratio. Okay, it's simply the probability that the new sequence you're looking at was generated by the same process of the old sequences. Where our model of generation is that each character in each position is generated by some probability distribution, and those. Character, the, the columns are independent of each other. You generate the character for position one according to some probability distribution, and then you generate uh, the character in position two by a probability distribution which is independent of the first one. Okay? Now, we don't actually know what those distributions are. All we get to do is, is estimate them by the actual uh, sequences that we, that we know about. Nonetheless, we've estimated what those probabilities are by the sequences we have in hand. And then we can evaluate a new sequence. What's the probability that it was generated by that same process? Simply by multiplying together the fractions from, uh, well, this is already the ratio, but multiplying the fractions uh, that we would see, uh, that, that's the numerator, and then divide it by the fractions we would see if this was random. So another way of saying what this position-specific scoring matrix is, is this is really an odds ratio, an odds ratio matrix. Okay. So again, those of you who are either in statistics or genetics, this should be very, very familiar as a way of evaluating uh, or testing a particular hypothesis, the hypothesis here being that um, uh, that the new sequence is random, or that it comes from the uh, another hypothesis that it comes from that family. Okay. So if you got all this, why do we take logs? Now, why is this instead of using an odds ratio? Why do people use a log odds ratio? And what is it? It means in this context that instead of using these numbers, we'll take the log of each one, et cetera. Hmm? Yeah, what? Zero. Oh, log zero is undefined. Okay. If I forget, I don't know about that. That's true. It means it's very bad. Yeah, that's true. But all the other. Yeah. I, I'm missing. I'm missing the point. Yeah. Yeah. You get a zero. Yeah. Well, so what do you, what do you want to find log zero as? You just have to define it right. If you change one um, first row to zero, the whole thing will be zero. Yeah. It means it's the probability that it can from that family zero. Right. But all the other methods are good. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you believe your data, okay, the, the comment that's coming up here is that what happened if we, 
if we took for uh, the third position to be A? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, let me get to that in a minute. Suppose you have an A here, okay? Then according to what we've done up here, when I take the product, this third position, instead of being 4, would be 0, okay? And so this whole product would be 0. And the comment is that seems, that seems like the wrong thing to do, okay? There are the two answers to that. One is... The, the really true conceptual ideal answer is that if you really believe that you have a true reflection of the family members over here and there is none that has an A uh, in the third position, then when you see a sequence that's got an A in the third position, if you really believe you've got a good reflection of this family, you have to conclude that it's just not a member of the family. So there's no problem. But People in the front row are more sophisticated, and they know that there are such things as errors and small uh, sample sizes, all kinds of reasons why you shouldn't believe a, an absolute zero, okay? So, in fact, uh, what people do in, in these circumstances is they have what's called a pseudo count. When you see real zeros in your data, you say, oh, that's not really a zero. I, I'm not sure really what it was. Maybe it's a very small number. Okay, so they'll use a small number based on some, uh, some belief. And if anybody here Bayesians uh, <laughs> or even know what that means, and some of you do. But another approach here is to say, well, I have some prior model about what these things really should be that's not exclusively based on, on the data in hand here. And therefore, you can have some other numbers besides zero even if you never saw an A in that position. Okay. But these are all um, fine points. I want you to understand, in this class, I want you to see the basic idea that uh, if you really have a good reflection of what this family is and you can compute those fractions and treat them as probabilities, then the right thing to do, and this is the main point, the right thing to do when you evaluate a new sequence is to take this ratio. Okay? And that tells you, that gives you an odds ratio. Now, you still have to decide where, what's a large enough threshold where you're going to accept that um, as being a member of the family and, and what isn't. Okay, well, let me go back to my question. I guess there's still a technicality here of what to do with the log of zero. Um, what do you want to define log zero as? Well, let me tell you, what, what do you want to do with these logs, logs of numbers? Okay, why do you take logs? Okay, go back to my question. Why do we want to take logs? Hmm? Yeah, there are lots of deep and, and uh, complex philosophical reasons and some, uh, but the main reason you take logs is because the log of a product is uh, the sum of the logs, right? So log x times y, x times y equals log x plus log y, okay? So um, if we take this fraction here, okay, and I consider taking the log of it, um, And now I, I take uh, all these numbers and instead of multiplying them before, as I did before, I can add them together. But again, I have to decide what I want log zero to be. Okay. So the point is that when you have this this matrix, when it was just the ratio of the products, or just, sorry, where they were just these numbers without the logs, 
the way you used them was to multiply those numbers together when you have a new sequence. If you've taken the log of each number, then the right way to use these numbers is to add them together. Okay? And what you get by adding them together is the log of that product. Okay, whereas before you had a product of ratios, now you have a log of that product of ratios. And this now gives you a log odds ratio table or a log odds ratio matrix. Okay? And the right thing to do is to add them together. So, so why do people want to use, take the logs? Because adding is easier than multiplying. That's about the only basic reason. And there, there are some other philosophical reasons for taking logs. It has to do with information theory. But I think in this context, the only explanation for why people take logarithms is to, to somehow simplify the arithmetic. You get to uh, do addition instead of doing multiplication. Multiplication is uh, sometimes more difficult. Okay. All right, but you do have this, you have this problem of what, what do you do with the log of zero. Um, if you wanted the product to be zero when there was a zero in there to tell you that this is absolutely out of the question, this sequence is no way, no how from that family, then when you're adding together, you probably should make log zero minus infinity. Okay? Something that um, you know, just is so small that when it, when it occurs, it tells you that uh, that new five mers is, is uh, outside the uh, realm of possibility. Okay. All right, so this is uh, the position-specific scoring matrices. And um, sometimes this is a very powerful, a powerful enough device. Uh, uh, by the way, you look at this 5-mer, and you decide whether or not that was from the family or not. And then you move over, and you take a look at this 5-mer, and so on. And uh, it, depending on the kind of family it is, it may only take a single 5-mer Uh, that's in the family to tell you that this whole sequence is uh, from that family or not. Of course, when you build up the database, yeah, question? I thought the denominator was supposed to be random. The what? The denominator was supposed to be random. Yes, right. Oh, I'm sorry, the five mers here are just, you're just scanning across, just taking like k-mers, okay? And you have a particular one that's here. And what you're doing in the, in the denominator is asking, what's the probability that this would be generated? This particular sequence is generated just by random selection of each character. OK? No. no OK. And I, actually, this, this, this reminds me, I didn't, I didn't fully explain the denominator. Why do you need the denominator? Why, why isn't it good enough just to have the numerator? You just take the product here, and you get this probability that it's from this family. You get some number. OK. Why do you? Uh... Why do we need the denominator? Well, the answer is really that just those numbers by themselves, the reference point, are, are meaningless. That it's hard to, you don't know what to make of them. Um, if, if you divide by the alternative hypothesis, which is this is just random, you really want to see how much more likely, how much more is the probability uh, that it came from this particular weird distribution, distribution of the family, non-random distribution, how much more likely is it that it came from there compared to just being randomly generated? Okay, so you need this as a kind of a normalizer. You need to say what's what's a a number you would expect if you're just picking things randomly, and then you want this to be uh, much larger. All right, and then that's another reason for taking the log. Okay, because you want this to be several um, powers larger. 
Okay, and the logarithm, again, that's just arithmetic convenience. But logarithms uh, reduce the powers. Instead of looking at the, at the whole number, you just look at, the, uh, at how many powers it is. Okay? So I hope that sort of explained why you need the uh, denominator here. Okay. The log also does another nice thing. Actually, um, let's just take an example. Here I have, maybe I really should go back to the original example, the full example, the full data. Okay. Oh, somebody was supposed to stop me. You're supposed to stop me at 10 minutes till 3. So to have time to, uh, okay, so I'll explain uh, the rest of why we take logs. And I'm going to put notes on the web which, um, which explains the logs and explains this whole business from today.